Hello and welcome to the excerpt. I'm Dana Taylor. The T-Rex of the sea, they call it. Its more formal name, Pliosaur. It's a giant prehistoric marine reptile and the discovery of the fossilized jaw and skull of one such Pliosaur has set enthusiasts on fire. What might these new bones teach us about how this ancient creature lived? One man with a front row seat to it all was legendary paleontologist Steve Etches, a plumber turned scientist who's been collecting fossils from what's known as the Jurassic Coast in southern England for more than 40 years. Steve is now curator for the Etches Collection Museum of Jurassic Marine Life in Kimmeridge, Dorset, where that pliosaur skull is now on display. Steve, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure. Tell us about the day of the Pliosaur discovery. After you were called to the site, what first caught your attention? And is this the most thrilling find of your career as a paleontologist? So it's not the most thrilling find, but let me just elaborate. I mean, the snout that dropped out the cliff and was found by a friend of mine uh, when he was walking along the beach. And it was two and a half miles away from where he could get a vehicle to. So he either had to carry it back in his rucksack or leave it there. So... Ash, who's, who's worked with us, we both went down, I think the very next day, with a, a short aluminium ladder and with two other helpers, we strapped this snout to the ladder and then carried it back about a mile and a half the other way uh, and then realised, I mean, we realised then it was a really spectacular find. We knew that the pliosaur skull, the rest of the skull had to be there because it was complete. There's no doubt about that at all. So what we did then is... Uh, came back with a drone, a little drone, and it turned out to be 12 metres up off the beach in a sheer cliff, very dangerous. So what we had to do is notify a couple of climbing firms to see if they'd be interested in helping us. We came in from the top, cleared the cliff off as we went, got down onto what I thought was a pliosaur skull, and sure enough it was, but it was preserved upside down, so it died. Then the excitement really grew because we knew exactly it was there. We So had to work out a way of actually extracting it getting the uh, techniques and the, the tools to do that and also a friend of mine Chris Moore who helped who helped me and I help him often on digs or prepping material he um, he's a great friend of David Attenborough so he notified David Attenborough and David Attenborough is very interested and he notified the BBC British Broadcasting Company and they came we drew up a contract and they filmed the whole uh, shebang from the start to the finish Oh, I love that it's not the most thrilling find of your career. I just can't imagine what could surpass that. Oh, lots of things. In the collection here, we got lots and lots of unique finds. So I think we got about 16 or 17 new species never been found before. And our, our best find actually is the smallest things, which are the world's first ammonite eggs. So ammonites were cephalopods. They lived in a shell. You find them in, in the States, all over the world but no one's ever found their eggs. So that was the most exciting one, finding those eggs and then proving to the scientific community that they were ammonite eggs because we had to find them inside the ammonites as well. So we did that and proved beyond doubt. But this is certainly the biggest vertebrate or the biggest skull I've ever cleaned and, and prepared. And that took six to nine months to actually do that off and on and to remove all the mudstone that was in and uh, conserve it and then clean it and get it to how you saw it in the film. I know that you and your team have been using state-of-the-art technologies to reveal details about this underwater predator. What do we know about how this fierce creature, I know that we know the um, position it was in when it died, but how it lived? The largest carnivorous reptiles that probably ever lived. And they're very diagnostic in their what their teeth are. They're very triangular teeth. Now, there's no other reptile in the Kimbridgean seas where I collect from that have these triangular teeth. So when you find, we find big limb bones of other pliosaurs and um, ichthyosaurs and, and plesiosaurs with huge great triangular bite marks in, we know that they're feeding on their, their own kind, smaller ones. They're feeding on plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and anything they can get down their throat. So they're the, the top of the food chain. They are the mega predator of the Kimbridge and Seas. Is there something special about the geography of Kimbridge Bay Dorset where you found not only the Pliosaur fossil, but so many others as well? Tell me about prehistoric life along the Jurassic Coast. Right, the Jurassic Coast, why it's called the Jurassic Coast, it covers the whole suite of Jurassic rocks from 200 million years ago to about 120 million years ago. And if you come along the Jurassic Coast, you walk from 
say, uh, west to east, you're going walking through time. So you're covering the whole suite of Jurassic rocks. Now, the Kimmage clay I collect from was long thought to be the least attractive to the British fossil collector of all the fossil formations to collect fossils from. But the last 40 years have proved beyond doubt that they missed a trick and there were certainly some really exquisite material here in the Kimmage clay. And the thing is with our pliosaur skull, it, its preservation is unique in the sense everything is there. Although it's slightly just crushed over and slightly and distorted, it, every part of element of that skull is there, the brain case and everything we want to study and everything else. Well, you mentioned this, um, but here in the U.S., PBS recently ran that BBC documentary, Attenborough and the Giant Sea Monster with Sir David Attenborough, where he's clearly awed by your discovery. Can you share a little bit more about your relationship with him um, and how you've collaborated with other researchers in your field? David Attenborough is a very good presenter. He's done another one. It's Attenborough and the Sea Dragon, which was an ichthyosaur from the Elias from a two and 200 million year old suite of rocks. And I was involved with that because Chris Moore, again, the guy who helped us, and his son, Alex Moore, helped us extract this skull. I helped them extract this other ichthyosaur. So I've met David Attenborough on there and other times before. And really, uh, he's he's a very sort of, he gets excited by sort of large reptilian remains in the in the Jurassic. So as soon as he knew about this, he had to be involved. And he's a good guy to work with, dead easy to talk to. There's no airs or graces. He's just very upfront, asked some really relevant questions. And he was thoroughly interested in in the whole subject. So I've read that roughly 10% of your collection is on display. First, where are you keeping the other 90%? And other than storage, what are some of the most significant challenges paleontologists face in their research today? Well, money. For a start, we're in, a, in England, we're, we're shook. I mean, let's put it this way. We know the rest of this skeleton is up in the cliff. And we need to extract that. And we've got to raise a certain amount of money to actually do that and go through the whole planning of it. So that's a, we've got a, um, a crowdfunding appeal out actually to raise that money to do that. So money's always been the problem. Every intention, if we collect the rest of the skeleton, we'd have to build a new gallery to house it, which we can do. But it's all down to money. And, of course, you must realise that um, in Britain used to be quite a wealthy country, but it's not now. So money is very difficult to access. Um, so we're hoping we can raise that money to do that because science will be the loser. If we don't collect this, then it will just erode and fall over the cliff. And the sea comes up the cliff every, you know, twice a day. We'd lose the whole lot. So for science, really, it would be fantastic if we could rescue it for the nation. I know that you've been collecting fossils since the age of five. I'm assuming that you would not advise biting down on any fossils that you find, which is something that you shared that you did. Any other advice, though, for aspiring paleontologists? A lot of people come here and say, you know, how do you find these things? And I always point to my eyes and say, well, just look. And paleontologists, you know, to collect fossils, all you need is, 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 is your eyes and something to extract it. Sometimes you find them loose on the beach. It's a really easy thing to do, but if you really want a, a, a job in paleontology in Britain, there's not a lot of um, places for that. And if you can think about it, I, yeah, I've been collecting for 40 years, but I had to, in tandem with that, actually work as a heating engineer, heating and plumbing uh, installer. So I had to do this as a back hobby, you know, on the back of that. Plumber to paleontologist is quite a career change. How did your interest in prehistoric creatures first start? It's like everything. It's when you're a child, it's discovery. You know, I love natural history, birds, fishing, all that sort of thing. And paleontology is one of the things that when, you know, as a child, you can do it, but you can't redo it fully. And it was only laterally uh, when I established my heating and plumbing business and could take a day off that I really went and collected it seriously. So it, it was done on that basis, really. Well, have any Hollywood producers reached out to ask for your insights in developing oh, an God. underwater Jurassic Park type movie? No, 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 not at all. But uh, well, I'm waiting for that movie. I want to see that movie. Not, OK, well, it's only going to happen in America, I can tell you, because in this country, I don't think it's going to happen. The whole collection, there's some fantastic stories of recovery of this material and um they're not sort of made up. There's some fan, you know, because it, where we collect is a remote area. It's a dangerous area that a lot of people don't go for that, primarily for that reason, probably, why it's been neglected in the past. And um, 
it's it's quite hazardous. I'm still here. I'm 74, so the rock hadn't sort of killed me yet. It's a passion that's just come true. It's not a job. It's just it's a really enjoyable thing to get involved in. Well, Steve, if there's one thing that you want listeners to walk away from our conversation with, one nugget uh, that most people should understand about ancient creatures, what would that be? The thing is, when we talk about sort of 150 million years ago, it's very difficult for people to realize that that actually things that existed at that time, we can't visualize that time, but you've got to remember, you're going back to a time when these animals thrived. Everything was in perfect balance. They were the top food chain predators down through the thing. And um, it's very good now to look back at those times and see how the world's progressed on. And there's one species that really is a bit of a thorn in the side to, to nature in some ways, and that's us, because we're changing the whole uh, ecology. And um, if we're not careful, we're using the world's resources up very, very quickly. We're expanding population-wise. We've got to be very careful the way we progress on with um, our sort of progress in this world in some ways. Um, so it's a perfect world when you look back, and uh, but it's very, as I say, very difficult to visualize those that time period. It's so glib, easy to sort of um, to to go back to those times and talk about it easily. And the other thing is, of course, you know, you've got now sending rockets up to the moon to discover water and that. Yet we don't know anything that lives in the sea now. There's a vast area, you know, two thirds of the world's covered in in water. We know little or, or very little of what goes on in the seas. We don't know if some of the even whales breed, where some of the go. There's so much more to learn in this world. And then finally, and we'll end on a fun one, who is the most ferocious prehistoric apex predator, one that lived on land or sea? Who would win the Godzilla versus kong size matchup between the Pliosaur and the T-Rex? Well, we had an American uh, guy who worked at Bristol who was asked that very question. And he said, and it could be an American, he said, he'd love to say dinosaur, but he said, no, it'd be the Pliosaur that would win. <laughs> So, Steve, thank you so much for being on the excerpt. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.